Merry Christmas, everybody. Thanks for joining More Sports and Les Levine, the weekend winner's edition. Hope your holidays are going well and you're enjoying them with the family. We're going to talk a little bit about the Cleveland Browns. Still very much control their own playoff destiny at 10-4. and four, They're getting ready to head back to New York to face the New York Jets, who won their first game of the season by beating the L.A. Rams uh, last Sunday. That's a playoff team as well. Whenever we talk Browns, we welcome in Brown's beat reporter here on cleveland.com, as well as in the pages of the Plain Dealer, Dan Lobby. Dan Brown's nine and a half point favorites uh, to, to beat the Jets, a team that got their first win, probably a good thing. But when you look at the Browns and you look at the offense, you have to be impressed. It, it looks as though Baker Mayfield has kind of taken that next step you had hoped you'd see from him. It, it really does. And, and really going back to that Tennessee first half, the way he played in that game, and then just the way he kept punching back against Baltimore, I thought was really impressive. And then to follow up that loss to Baltimore with just a really methodical win over the Giants and, and to do it in a way that we haven't always seen the Browns, you know, beat teams in methodical ways. They did it through the air. They leaned on Baker's arm. I mean, he was decisive on Sunday night. Uh, he, he was quick with the football. He got it out in under three seconds uh, throughout the game. This was really kind of, I know it's only his third year, so it's weird to say this, but this was kind of vintage Baker on Sunday night, I thought. Yeah, and, and you know, the thing is, is we tend to forget third system for him offensively, and you can tell he's kind of settling in, and, and it looks like he and Kevin Stefanski have a real good feel for what the other needs and wants to do. I think part of the credit has to go with Kevin Stefanski realizing what Baker does well and playing to it. Right, and, and there's been a lot of chatter this week about, well, you know, Baker's, you know, kind of playing so well because of this play action stuff, because of this system. And you know what? That's okay, because that's what you're supposed to do. The guy he's going to play this week would probably love to be in a situation that, that really fit his strengths, but it hasn't happened for him. Uh, so Baker is really taking advantage of everything the Browns have put around him, a great offensive line, all the talent he has in the receiving core, uh, a system that fits what he wants to do. And we're starting to see him take steps. You know, Sunday night, there were a few plays where he had a guy wide open in front of him, like a Kareem Hunt, or on the touchdown pass to Jarvis Landry. David Njoku was wide open in the front of the end zone, but Baker kind of got aggressive and, and made the more aggressive throws in, in those situations. And that's a sign to me that he's getting more and more comfortable running this offense. I think the other thing is, and, and you have to be confident to do this he's willing to throw the ball away when the play is dead and and that's something you have to realize okay we're in a no-win situation here don't make a mistake at a critical time get the next play and let's go and I think you have to be confident to do that and I think that's another part of the growth that we're seeing with him it's a huge sign of progress and it's why he's not turning the ball over as much because he's not feeling this need to make a play every single time they've trained him now and it kind of goes back, you know, that Pittsburgh game, I think if Baker continues on this trajectory and is this team's quarterback for the next however many years, we might look back at that Pittsburgh game and, and say that's kind of where everything turned around because, you know, he threw two interceptions in the second half against the Colts, two interceptions against the Steelers, his first pass against the Bengals got intercepted. And then something clicked, something changed. And you know, maybe the weather in November helped him out a little bit. It, it kind of forced him to be more of a game manager and not as much of a gunslinger. And now he's sort of understood, you know, it's okay to throw the ball away. It's even okay to take an intentional grounding penalty. You know, a lot of those things are better than turning the football over a bunch because this offense is good enough that even if they have one empty possession here or there, it's not going to kill them. The other thing that I think was impressive is there was a point in the game where the Browns could take over the game, and they did. A couple of 95-yard drives um, and another 75-yard drive. I think you add the time of the drives together, it's like 20 minutes in touchdown drives. That's a sign of a really good offense. Yeah, and this is what Kevin Stefanski has sort of quietly made his calling card, is just being able to possess the football and put together these long drives to keep an opposing offense on the sideline. And he did it this time through the air. You know, the running game was a part of the plan on Sunday night. But it wasn't the plan. He used a lot of Baker Mayfield. He used a lot of quick passes. We saw some screens to the tight ends. And then the, the really interesting thing about Baker's game now is he's running with the ball at, at opportune moments. You know, early on that drive, on the first set of downs, on third down and four, he had a scramble up the middle. Baker's not going to wow you with his legs. But if he can make those little runs to convert a third and four, which basically helped start that second 95-yard drive, 
that, that just kills a defense because they think they have everything covered. You've got a quarterback that you're not necessarily worried about running. And now, you know, he's going to do just enough with his legs to keep drives moving. The, the run game didn't put up the gaudy numbers that it has in the past um, and, and hasn't for a couple of weeks. Is that a concern or is it more a function of, you know, Kevin Stefanski is looking at it and going, okay, they want us to beat him in the air. We'll beat him in the air. I, I think that run game is still there. I, I think what we saw early in the year and, and really, like I said, in those bad weather games in November was this team leaning on the run game because they had to. But I do think this is a team that wants to move the football through the air. And, you know, this is an analytics-driven organization. And analytics does favor kind of that quick passing game in, in a lot of instances. So, you know, they're not going to be afraid to be a pass-heavy football team. But they know they can lean on Nick Chubb and they can lean on Kareem Hunt. And, you know, once again, going to that second 95-yard drive, you know, Nick Chubb had a couple of pretty good runs on that drive, including his longest run of the night. So I think this this coaching staff understands that if they need to lean on that run game and go back to that run game, they can do it. Well, we we got another, what would be the third offensive lineman in the rotation in uh, Nick Harris, who came in and filled in for Hubbard very early in the game and played pretty well. You're starting to see that a lot. We saw it with Sheldrick Redwine on the defensive side of the ball. Is that a sign of the work that Andrew Barry's doing, or is it a sign of the work that this coaching staff is doing and coaching them up? I think it's kind of a sign of that that alignment they've been seeking, right? Because it feels like everything Andrew Barry did this offseason has worked. And a big piece of that is the guys he's brought in, this coaching staff has just worked to really develop. So a guy like Donovan Peoples-Jones or Nick Harris. You know, Nick Harris doesn't get playing time really except on special teams and then he's thrown into action against a pretty good Giants defensive line and he played well this is a guy that played center in college his last few years he did play a little bit of guard when he first got to Washington I thought maybe he was a guy that would have a chance to compete at right guard in a normal offseason and then he had to fill in for J.C. Treader in training camp so he never got a shot to do that it obviously worked out well for the Browns but to have these young guys these rookies ready to come in and step in and play important roles. One, it means Andrew Barry identified their talent, but two, it means that these coaches from the position coach, really starting with the position coaches, are really working to develop these guys and get these guys ready. Uh, Teller, again, banged up. Wyatt Teller, um, unable to go. How big of a piece is he to that offensive line? And, and let me put it to you this way as well. Joel Batonio made the Pro Bowl. Miles Garrett did. Nick Chubb did. If Wyatt Teller doesn't miss a game, do you think he ends up being a pro bowler? I, I kind of do because of the way he had graded out. It, I think he would have had a chance. But the problem you have on the offensive line is sometimes it's kind of a reputation thing. I mean, it took Joel Batonio a little time to start making pro bowls. And once you kind of break through, if you're an offensive lineman, you can kind of just hang on to that position for a, a long time. Now, obviously, Joe Thomas is a guy that made it as a rookie, but uh, you know some guys, especially in those interior positions, have to wait a little while. I think Wyatt Teller, like league-wide, is still kind of, uh, I don't want to say an unknown, but he's still sort of building that, that brand a little bit to get some of those votes from players and coaches and fans. Uh, so there can be a little bit of a lag there. I mean, think about a guy like J.C. Treader, who you know, I think has been as good a center as there is in football since the Browns brought him here. You know, he, he never really gets voted into the Pro Bowl, so that, that's a tough position to get into. Uh, in, in the Pro Bowl, and, and Batonio is kind of getting there now, not not just because he's playing well, but because he's established that reputation. How important is Teller? I, I mean, that's a guy that uh, he's big and he's physical, and how how much better is the Browns' offensive line when, when they can plug that monster in over uh, guard? So after Teller got hurt initially, Nick Chubb was out at the same time, and, and there was some discussion, you know, who's more important to the run game, Nick Chubb or Wyatt Teller? And we were never really able to answer that question because they were both out at the same time and came back at the same time. Maybe we're going to get a little bit of that answer. Maybe part of the struggles on Sunday night were because Wyatt Teller wasn't out there. So it, it's worth keeping an eye on it. You know, if he's unable to go on Sunday, which it looks like he won't be able to, or you know, if he's not back until the postseason, to kind of see how this running game plays uh, with Wyatt Teller out and then how it might look when he comes back uh, for that potential first uh, playoff game. Let's shift our focus a little bit to the receivers. Uh, you have to like the job that Jarvis Landry has done, and, and it really looks like Kevin Stefanski realizes he's kind of got a, a wide-receiving Swiss, Swiss Army knife. I think the part that fans might overlook a little bit is Landry's a really good blocker in that run game. 
Yeah, and he, and he loves it too. I mean, he's not just a good blocker. He loves to block. He loves that physical part of the game. He's such a competitive guy. And, and you know, we saw it on Sunday night. Sometimes that comes out in, in different ways. And, you know, he didn't think he deserved a flag for, for that taunting. And, and I didn't either, but he's kind of got that reputation. That's who Jarvis is. But that's a good thing for the Browns to have that sort of attitude and competitiveness. And the things Kevin Stefanski is doing with him now, uh, it's really interesting. All the pre-snap motion, teams have to be aware of him kind of splitting out wide, lining up in the slot, going in motion. I mean, he was in the backfield on one play, and Kareem Hunt was split out wide. So Jarvis Landry just unlocks a lot of things that Kevin Stefanski wants to do in this offense. And by the way, he catches almost everything. I know he's had some drops this year, but these tight window throws that Baker Mayfield delivers, Jarvis is a big reason why he's able to complete those. And we saw with the Giants, Colt McCoy made a couple throws that some receivers weren't able to haul in. Uh, Jarvis Landry, he, he catches all of those. Uh, the other guy that uh, has had a great, you know, is a great comeback story for the Browns is Rashard Higgins. Um, he has probably played his way into the future of this team just with the way he has stepped up in uh, Odell Beckham Jr.'s absence since his injury. Higgins is such an interesting guy because, you know, he was he was cut when Hugh Jackson was here and the Browns went 0-16 and, and got back because of injury. Got in Freddie Kitchen's doghouse and didn't play much last year. Even at the start of this year, you know, we can sit here and give this coaching staff all kinds of credit for Higgins. But, I mean, let's be honest. He was inactive at the beginning of the year and only playing garbage time when he was active. Finally got forced into action and took advantage of it. And, you know, the credit to Higgins is every time he's out there. And and I don't know why people have always been so hesitant to put him out there. Maybe it's because he's not the fastest guy. Uh, Maybe he doesn't check a lot of those athletic boxes. But every time he's out there, he proves that he should be out there even more. And you know, now that the Browns have a little continuity, they have a coaching staff that's going to stick around, a front office that's going to stick around, this should give Higgins an opportunity after what he's done this year to really settle in. Dan Lobby, Browns beat reporter here on Cleveland.com, as well as in the pages of the Plain Dealer. We're going to step aside, take a quick time out. When we return, Dan and I flip sides of the ball. We'll talk Browns defense as the Browns are getting ready for the Jets, trying to secure a playoff berth here in 2020. More sports and Les Levine, the weekend winners edition. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Presque Downs and Casino has sports betting. Use one of our 50 state-of-the-art Bet America kiosks to place your bet and watch your favorite games on one of our many HD televisions or visit our sportsbook area only at Presque Downs and Casino. Do you like Ohio State football? Would you like to get information from me, Doug Maurice, about Ohio State football without having to look at my face? We have got the plan for you. Become an Ohio State text subscriber through cleveland.com. You send a text, 614-350-3315. What do you get? Two, three, four texts right in your phone every day about Ohio State football. Inside information, polls, voting. All kinds of things. You can be on our podcast. We take text subscriber questions on our Buckeye Talk podcast every week. If you really want to be involved with Ohio State football, in season or out of season, become an Ohio State text subscriber from Cleveland.com. Send a text to 614-350-3315. 14-day free trial. What do you have to lose? $3.99 a month after that. 614-350-3315. I'll see you in your phone. Tri-C is here for you. Now more than ever, you need a post-secondary education. So I encourage you to start your journey here at Tri-C. The majority of fall classes will take place online, but we've added a variety of formats to meet your learning needs, and we've taken many steps to keep you safe on campus. Whether you're ready to get started or your four-year plans have changed, Tri-C is where futures begin. The Ohio Lottery Partners in Education program recognizes role model students and teachers from across Ohio. Nominations can now be done completely online. To nominate a deserving teacher or student, go to ohiolottery.com. In the About section, find Partners in Education. There you will find links to the nomination forms. Students kindergarten through 12th grade can be academic all-stars. 
Teachers can be honored as a teacher of the month. The Ohio Lottery, partners in education, where stars shine. More sports and Les Levine. The weekend winner's edition continues. Happy holidays. Hope you and your family are enjoying it together. While well, the Browns are getting ready to face the New York Jets in New York, nine and a half point favorites. Let's welcome back in Dan Lobby, Browns beat reporter here on Cleveland.com as well as in the pages of the Plain Dealer. Dan, let's shift focus to the defensive side of the ball. What about the game Carl Joseph played? Kind of came out of nowhere, uh, led the team in tackles, had some really big plays as well. Yeah, they needed that out of him. This is a veteran guy they brought in, gave him a one-year deal, kind of took a chance on him. Now, I don't know what Carl Joseph's long-term future is here, but as short-handed as they were in the secondary, to have him be able to play like he did, especially coming up and playing in the box, kind of that, that hybrid linebacker safety position, that's a big game for him. And, you know, Joe Woods should be able to maybe find something for him moving forward uh, in some spots. They, they needed Carl Joseph to show them something Sunday night. Now, they, uh, the Browns had two fourth down stops that were critical to, to winning that game, held the Giants to just six points. Um, the defense has played better in spots. I mean, uh, you know, it's not going to be a shutdown kind of defense, but if you get those kind of big plays, I think that's the recipe to winning. That's exactly it. If you're expecting this defense to be the 2000 Baltimore Ravens or – you know, whoever else you want to throw out there, it's it's not going to happen. This defense just isn't going to shut people down. They aren't talented enough. They need to be opportunistic. And, you know, you go back to Tennessee a few weeks ago, they get a fumble against Derrick Henry. They get a fourth down stop. That gives the ball to the offense. The offense is able to put up points. All of a sudden, you're up multiple scores. Uh, the Giants, same kind of thing. They get in the red zone. You get some fourth down stops. It's just all about being opportunistic and getting the ball back in the hands of your offense whenever you can. because said it after the game he knew he needed to be aggressive he knew he needed to score points to win this game not threes he needed sevens and you're going to see a lot of teams kind of looking at this Browns offense now and understanding that's how they have to attack it so if the defense can just do enough to make sure the teams are either turning the ball over getting stopped on fourth down or having to settle for field goals that's going to help this offense out a ton Sheldrick Redwine a, a younger guy played pretty well again it's it's kind of interesting it seems like every time he's forced into action, he does some good things. Is, is he the kind of guy that shows the growth in this roster as a whole, do you think? I think he is. I think he's one of those guys that's just, you know, he's ready when they need him. I don't know what his long-term outlook is here, especially because they have young safeties in that room already. And, I mean, the reality is that they've had opportunities to get him on the field more, and they, and they haven't done it. But when he, they have had to turn to him and when they have had to put him out there, he's done just enough to help this, help this defense out and help them win some football games. So I, I think it just speaks to the mentality of this team that you know next man up is, is such a cliche in football, and, and I don't always buy into it because sometimes, you know, how do you replace a guy like a Miles Garrett or, or someone like that? But guys have to be ready to play and contribute and make that one or two plays where you know it can maybe not if it doesn't swing a game, at least it kind of helps swing the momentum. Um, that secondary was banged up, especially safeties. Is there any update on uh, on the guys that missed uh, the last couple of games, Indejo and, and Harrison? Well, the, the really good news is Ronnie Harrison was designated to return. That doesn't necessarily mean he'll play on Sunday against the Jets, uh, but you know we'll see how the Browns approach this. But we should know by Saturday if, uh, if he's able to go, if they decide to activate him. Uh, they don't have to do that for, I think it's 21 days. I don't think it'll be that long, but it's really good news that he's back off injured reserve and they've designated him to return because they need him out there. Another guy, Andrew Sandejo, he's out of concussion protocol. He should be able to go on Sunday uh, if they want to have him out there. I don't know how Browns fans necessarily <laughs> feel about that, uh, but Sandejo is back. Um, and then uh, Mac Wilson, a healthy scratch. What um, what do you make of that? It, it was in, it was surprising, but uh, you know, at the same time, you just kind of look at what he's done this season, and it hasn't been a great season for him. And against Baltimore, uh, he played over 20 snaps, didn't register a tackle, just really didn't play well. And and I think with Jacob Phillips being able to play more, I think they'd rather give the reps to him. Malcolm Smith, I mean, what a really good signing by uh, Andrew Barry there. He's been really good in this linebacking core. Of course, B.J. Goodson is going to play a ton of snaps. And I, and I think when you look at that numbers game. 
if Mike Prefer isn't saying, hey, I need Mac Wilson on special teams, maybe it's going to be hard for him to get back on the field. You, you look at the Jets and, and um, you know, the, their main running back is Frank Gore, who he's got to be about 50. I mean, he can shop early at the, uh, at the stores. He's, he's that far along in age. And then Sam Darnold as well. They don't have an explosive offense. I mean, and I'm not they, – they didn't win a game until last week. What worries you about about this Jets offense? I mean, honestly, there's, there's not a lot that, that really worried me. I, I know, like you said, they won that game. But, I mean, I think Frank Gore won me a fantasy league in like 2007. So he, <laughs> he's been around forever. Uh, you know, look, Sam Darnold, I, I like Sam Darnold's talent. You know, I liked him coming out of USC. I know there were turnover issues and those have continued in the NFL. I think this is a guy that if he got into a system that really suited him well, he'd be a you know franchise quarterback, but I think he can be a good quarterback for somebody. So I guess just that talent level of Sam Darnold, if you catch him on a day when he's making those throws that he can make on the move and he's putting the ball, you know, if he's just throwing dimes out there, that's, I guess, what worries you about this offense. If you get the really, really good version of Sam Darnold. And again, they don't, it's not like they have a, a phenomenal wide receiver. There's Crowder and uh, Perriman, who was here, and Berrios. But it's not like this offense or defense for that. There's a reason they've only won one game. I mean, I, I guess that's the bottom line is there's a reason the Jets have won one game this year. Yeah, exactly. This is not a good football team. And no one should look at that win last week and say, you know, oh, well, hey, maybe the Jets are turning it around a little bit. You know, Quinn and Williams is playing really well on the defensive line. That That's a guy I know that Marcus May had a really good game last week at safety, and he's a guy that, that you can sort of build uh, on that defensive side of the ball a little bit as they move forward. But this is a team that was playing for the number one pick, and they lost the number one pick last week. So, no, I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing for the Browns. That, that maybe, you know, maybe they're going to, they really want to lose this game just to see if Jacksonville will slip up, or maybe they just don't care at this point. But, you know, there's nothing that really worries me about this football game. All right, we've come to the uh, the point in the show where we are going to see how you think this game unfolds, maybe who you pick. Brown's nine-and-a-half-point favorites. Um, what are you thinking with this one? I, I mean, I, I hate big lines. I always do. They they freak me out. But I'd, it's just really hard for me to see with the way the Browns went in there last week against the Giants and just – systematically took them apart and and the Browns probably could have won that game 30 to six if they wanted to. I don't think they'll have any trouble with the Jets. I think they'll win this game by at least two scores easily. I, I would go something like 30 to 14. Yeah. I, I think, you know, the only way it comes apart is if they turn the ball over a lot, they can probably survive a turnover or two. If you get up to three or four, that could be a problem, but I think the Browns win this one comfortably. The other thing is, is, you know, if the Browns win and the Colts beat the Steelers, that game in two weeks is for the AFC North Championship. And who would have thought that back when the Steelers were 11-0? and 0? Right. There's a, there's a lot of interesting playoff scenarios out here. Obviously, if, if the Steelers end up winning, the Browns can't win the North, but a Browns win would, would put them in the playoffs at least. So uh, I guess for Browns fans, it's, it's kind of what do, you want, what do you want to see more in Week 17? Have this team have everything clinched or have a chance to maybe get the AFC North title? So. Uh, it's, it's going to be a fun two weeks seeing this team try to put the finishing touches on a playoff. For hey, we're talking NFL playoffs uh, around <laughs> Christmas and New Year's in Cleveland. That's a, that is a good thing. We haven't had that in a long, long time. And here's what fans should remember. I, I know there's a doomsday scenario out there where they go 11-5 and five and miss the playoffs, but the Browns control their destiny. They win the next two, yep. they're in for sure. Absolutely. And uh, if the Colts, if they win against the Jets and the Colts win – there's the chance for the AFC North. If the Steelers win, they're in So as, as a wild card. So it's all good. Plenty of chances for the Browns to qualify. Dan Lobby, as always, appreciate the insight. I'm sure we will be checking back in with you um, as the Browns move forward and, and try to lock down that, uh, that wild card, maybe even the, uh, the North division. It'd be fun. Thanks for having me. All right, Dan Lobby, Browns beat reporter here on Cleveland.com, as well as in the pages of The Plain Dealer. Want to remind you, there's some more football straight ahead. Ohio State getting ready for the Sugar Bowl college football playoff national semifinal against the Clemson Tigers. Stephen Means, Buckeyes beat reporter, straight ahead on More Sports and Less Levine, the weekend winner's edition. Stay with us.
Transform your home for the holidays with an authentic Nature Stone garage floor. No more tripping on cracked, uneven concrete. Stop slipping on puddles and standing water. It's the safer, more beautiful garage floor that's easy to clean and never needs replaced. That's why it's backed by Russell's Promise. For a limited time, get more Nature Stone than ever before with up to half your garage floor free. Schedule your free cost estimate easily online today at naturestone.com to qualify for your free flooring. It's not just a floor. Wow, it's Nature Stone. There are tastes we remember. Every smell brings the happiness of times gone by. Experience this every time you walk into Gallucci's Italian Foods. Whether you need lunch on the go, a catered party, or that perfect blend of wine, meats, and cheeses, Gallucci's has exactly what you're looking for. Straight from Mama's Kitchen. For old world traditions or original experiences. From the tastes you remember to new flavors you'll never forget. Gallucci's is a tasty branch of your family tree. When it comes to selling you a mattress, most retailers are handing you a line, a long line of extra steps that drive up costs and create confusion. At the Original Mattress Factory, we simplify the mattress shopping experience by building mattresses and box springs in our own local factories and selling them direct to you. It's short, sweet, and simply makes sense. So experience more than just the mattress store. Experience an original, the Original Mattress Factory. Welcome back to more sports and Les Levine, the weekend winner's edition. Time to turn our attention to the college football playoff national semifinals. Buckeyes, one of four teams dreaming of being national champs. Buckeyes will face Clemson in the one semifinal. Notre Dame and Alabama will face each other in the other. The winners of those two games meet for the national championship game. The Buckeyes will face the Clemson Tigers in Dabo Sweeney. And when we talk Ohio State Buckeyes, we welcome in Stephen Means, Buckeyes beat reporter here on Cleveland.com, as well as in the pages of The Plain Dealer. Stephen, appreciate your time very much. Dabo Sweeney came out and, and was pretty vocal that he didn't necessarily think the Buckeyes deserved to be in the playoffs and, in fact, said he voted them 11th in the coaches poll. How do you think that sits with Ryan Day and the, and the folks uh, in that Buckeyes locker room? You know him as well as anybody. What's their response to that? Yeah, I don't know if Ohio State needed any more bulletin board material to not like this program, but Davos Winnie keeps giving it to him anyway, whether it's voting him 11th in the coaches poll or consistently saying throughout the last couple of weeks that a team who only plays six games probably doesn't deserve to be in the playoffs in the first place. And not to mention, oh yeah, he's beaten them four times in the past decade. I think there's enough reasons why da the Ohio State doesn't like Dabo Sweeney, while Ohio State fans don't like Dabo Sweeney, and more importantly, that, that football program as a whole. So it just adds that fuel to the fire that all stems back from really that Fiesta Bowl in 2019, where if, I mean, everybody can make the argument that Ohio State should have won that game if some things going their way. Yeah, and the flip side of it is if, if you're going to have teams from two conferences, the SEC and the ACC, it's not a national championship. It's the ACC-SEC Invitational like they do in basketball. So, you know, Dabo just needs to worry about coaching his team. When you talk about um, Ohio State, you know, the Big Ten championship game, Justin Fields just seemed a little off. Are you concerned about that? What did you think? What do you think the reasons are with that? Is it all the guys that were missing? I think it's a combination of a few things. One, Chris Olave didn't play. That's a very valuable play piece, and you realize just how valuable he was when he wasn't out there and basically everything had to flow through Garrett Wilson at that point in the passing game. But also, some play calling. I think this offense has a tendency to try to go for the home run on every single pass play when it was very clear in that game that, hey, Trey Sermon can do whatever he wants against this Northwestern defense. Just give him the ball and let this offensive line block for him. And you saw some of the similar issues in the Indiana game for this last reason. I, I just think sometimes Justin Fields can turn into a boomer bust player. And when it's boom, it's awesome. It's really awesome. It's 18 of 19 for 300 yards and four touchdowns type awesome. But when it's not awesome, it's three interceptions and five sacks. And you're not really sure what he's doing out there. So I, I think there has to be a middle ground here now that we've gotten to the playoffs and the team he's going to be facing is talent equated. They don't have to necessarily scheme for him. They can just be just as good as they are. So it's a combination of a lot of different things where I don't know what it is this year, but it's not like he looks rattled. He just 
doesn't look that look as poised as he did in 2019. And he's got to fix that because Clemson is a lot better than anybody else Ohio State's faced this year. When you look at uh, Fields, are you concerned about him or do you kind of expect him to to be as good as he can be in, in some of the better games? Like, uh, you know, the biggest games for, for Justin Fields are coming up, um, you know, New Year's Day and, and hopefully the following week. Yeah, I, my money's on he'll be fine. He played pretty well last year. Also, the two interceptions, one was a top 10 NFL draft pick making a top 10 NFL draft pick type play. And the other one is Chris Olave just lost communication and made a bad move. I think he'll be fine in these games. I think what we learned, honestly, in that Big Ten championship game is if the running game is going to be solid. Now, I'm not saying that Eddie George's record is going to get breaking <laughs> every single game for the rest. of That's just not that's not reasonable to say. But if we have a solid running game going and this defense can continue to get stops, the last thing I'm worried about is Justin Fields and his passing attack because that's the best weapon they have. So if all those other things are, are playing well and the passing game improves because maybe Chris Olave is back and Justin Fields plays more poised, I like Ohio State's chances. What do you what do you make of the way Trey Sermon played? I mean, um, yeah, I mean, he, like you said, he broke Eddie George's rushing record. Did did that come out of nowhere for you, or did you know that was something he was capable of? The record came out of nowhere. Him playing well, not necessarily. If you look at how he played through the six regular season games, he steadily improved as he got more comfortable in this team. You got to remember, he transferred here six months ago during a pandemic. So he didn't get a spring here, and he really didn't get a real fall camp either because, well, we have to social distance, and they can't do all the normal things that are required to play football. So he's had to slowly progress throughout the season, and we saw it in the Michigan State game where he had a 100 rushing yard type of game. So if he would have had, I don't know, 150 yards, then it would be like, okay, yeah, this is on pace for what he's been doing all year, steadily improving. But no, you can never – 331 yards, you can never really – plan for uh, outside of Northwestern keeping like four guys in the box and just saying daring Ohio State to run on them. But no, I did think that maybe in a hundred yard game was in his airspace. And I think that's a similar thing, whether it's him or Master Teague is available with Clemson if it's allowed. Is he the type of um, the type of running back that, um, you know, can can do that, though? I, I mean, does he have the skill set you think to be a threat to a really good Clemson defense? I think the skill set is there. I don't know if the consistency to do it all season, uh, do it an entire game is there, especially against a more talented defensive front like they're going to face against Clemson. He did have some problems maybe hitting a hole and not dancing in it earlier in the season. I'm interested to see if that comes back at all. But at the same time, I've seen some people throw it out there that he seems to be on the same trajectory that Ezekiel Elliott was in 2014, where he didn't start out great in that season, if you remember. But by the time they got to the Big Ten championship game, he was running all over teams, and then he basically ran Ohio State into a national championship. I'm not saying he's going to be Zeke. I am saying the paths right now are similar. And if it, if the play calling calls for it and Clemson tries to take away Ohio State's passing attack the way that Northwestern did, I'm not going to take it off the table. Stephen Mean, Buckeyes beat reporter here on Cleveland.com, uh, talking with him about the Buckeyes-Clemson game. Now, the Big Ten reduced the number of days that uh, a player has to be in isolation from 21 to 17. Does that help the Buckeyes at, at, at all, given the fact that they had so many out for that Big Ten championship game? Yeah, there's a reason they picked 17, because I think Chris Olave is going to be back on day 16. Yeah, of course, of course, of course it's helped. Listen, listen this is not a uh, help Ohio State rule. This is a help the Big Ten best team rule, who just happens to be Ohio State. If it had been Indiana and Indiana had Ty Freifogel out for 16 days, the rule would have been 17 or whatnot. Because, yes, you're in the playoff. you got your best team in the playoff. Now you want them to have an opportunity to actually compete. And you can't do that if you've got a first-round NFL draft pick at wide receiver and then a starting linebacker who's played pretty well as a former five-star recruit, both sitting on the sidelines or, or, as a matter of fact, sitting at home because they had a positive test. So, yeah, I, this helps Ohio State. They're, they want them to be at full strength as much as possible. Chris Olave would have only needed 10 days. The rule would have been 11 or 9 days. I guarantee it. That, this is the Big Ten helping its best program. So, yeah. All right, let's move forward. Some keys to uh, to this matchup. What do you think some keys are for the Buckeyes to come away um, and, and possibly defeat Clemson? One is Trevor Lawrence can only hurt you one way. He can't hurt you with his feet and with his arm. You can't. I'm just, he's too good at both. And if he's got 280 yards and 90 rushing yards to go along with it and four total touchdowns, you probably lost that football game as Notre Dame found out. He's either got to hurt you with his arm or hurt you with his legs. Take one of those away. And then that leads into Travis Etienne as well. 
Ohio State's got a great front seven who can take away a run, which means well, the way that Clemson uses Travis Etienne is very similar to the way the New Orleans Saints use Alvin Kamara, where they use him in the passing attack. So that that's really going to be on Pete Warner, who's now the will linebacker. So his first responsibility is stopping the run or in the passing attack, stopping the running back who might be coming out for a pass. Can Pete Warner do that? Can they slow down Patrick? Can they slow down Travis Etienne? And you know, you can limit him as a rusher, but can you limit him as a pass catcher as well? So that way you're limiting Trevor Lawrence in the run and you're limiting Travis Etienne in the run. So now you're asking them to pass. And then you're just telling your secondary, listen, you cannot give up five, six, seven, eight big plays like you did against Indiana. You have to be better in this game. And that starts with Sean Wade, who will probably be matched up on Amari Rodgers. You look at uh, offensively, what are some of the things the Buckeyes need to do to, to, to get that done um, and beat Clemson in this game as well? Don't force it. Whether and that's to Ryan Day and the Justin Fields. If it's not there, throw the ball away or run. You're one of the best athletes in college football. If you don't see anything down the field, you are allowed to use your legs, Justin. I don't know how many quarterbacks in college football are better at using their legs than you are. Use them. But more importantly, Ryan Day can't put his quarterback in situations where he's going to make more mistakes than he might already make. If the passes are not there and the running game is, you have to rely on that. You have to take what the defense gives you sometimes because it might open up a deep ball as Chris Olave or, or Garrett Wilson. But you can't force it in the name of being aggressive. And that goes to both Ryan Day and Justin Fields. Gut feeling. Do, do you think the Buckeyes get it done in advance to the national championship game? Whew, that's a... It's a tough one. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I would say yes, I think. I, I think these teams match up very well. Everything, I, and I think so. Yeah, I think we see a similar situation where the last six minutes decide this game, which would be poetic justice, by the way. And maybe Ohio State's on a two-minute drill drive the last two minutes, and instead of breaking off the route, Chris Olave keeps with his route and he redeems himself the best way possible. So yeah, I, I think there's a chance Ohio State can pull this game out. It's going to be close though. It'll be similar to last year's. Stephen Means, Buckeyes beat reporter here on Cleveland.com, as well as in the pages of the Plain Dealer. Appreciate the time and the insight. Thanks very much, Stephen. Thanks for having me. All right, Stephen Means, Buckeyes beat reporter. We're all out of time on this edition of More Sports and Les Levine, the weekend winner's edition. Continue to have a happy and safe holiday, and we will see you again next time right here on More Sports and Les Levine, the weekend winner's edition.